Welcome into this special video for ME429. As promised, I want to go over an example problem where we're looking at failure theories for a thin lamina. And so this is coming from the very last slide of the lecture notes on failure theory for thin unidirectional lamina. So we'll do an example problem here. I'll post it really quick so that you can see it. If you want to copy the problem statement down, go ahead and pause the video. It's the beauty of YouTube, I guess. Pause the video, copy down the problem statement. Otherwise, I'm just going to get right into it. Okay, so I'll share my screen here. You'll see the white pad and I'm going to bring up the problem that we're going to work on. Very last slide of the unidirectional thin laminate failure theory notes. So here we go with this example problem. We have a unidirectional eagle ass epoxy lamina loaded under biaxial compression as shown. So we have sigma X and we have sigma Y bearing down on this thin unidirectional lamina. If our stress in the X direction, negative 600 MPa, stress in the Y direction, negative 85 MPa, we want to determine if failure is predicted with a variety of these failure theories that we talked about in class. We're given the information about the stresses that would cause failure down here below for this particular uh, lamina. So note here that our fiber direction is 10 degrees off of the actual XY coordinate system for this particular problem. So go ahead and copy this problem right now if you want um, by pausing the video. Otherwise, I'm just going to jump right into the solution here. Okay, away we go. So first things first is we're given the stresses in an XY coordinate system. So let's put those down here. We're given that we're under biaxial loading with the following stress vector in the XY coordinate system. We're told we have negative 600 MPa in X. We're told we have negative 85 in Y and no shear stress in this XY coordinate system. All right. Now, the first step that we want in all of these sort of failure theory problems is we want to put the stresses that are applied on our particular lamina into principal material coordinates. So we need sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 6 to proceed with our failure analysis. So we'll use, we know that we can get the stress vector in the one, two coordinate system by using our transformation matrix T. Here we're using sort of the plane stress transformation matrix multiplied by the stresses that we have in our XY coordinate system. This is how we're gonna calculate the stresses in the one, two. Just a reminder what this T matrix looks like for plane stress, this is going to be a three by three that looks something like m squared, n squared, 2mn, n squared, m squared, negative 2mn, negative mn, mn, and m squared minus n squared, where m is equal to cosine theta for us here. That's cosine 10 degrees for this particular problem. And n is sine theta, which for us is going to be sine 10 degrees. OK, I trust that you guys could work out this T matrix. And so let's go ahead and solve for the stresses sort of in the principal material directions, this sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6. All right. So solving, we want our sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 6. If you calculate the T matrix, I'll just put it here for reference. It's going to be something like 0.97 in this first entry, 0 0.03 in the 1, 2 entry, 0 0.342, 0 0.03, 0.97, negative 0 0.342, 0 0.171, negative 0 0.171, and then in this 6-6 six, six entry, we have 0 0.94. This gets multiplied by our stresses in the XY coordinate system, which is negative 600, negative 85, and 0 MPa. 
All right. So you work this, all this out, and you'll get that the stresses in the 1, 2, 3 coordinate system are going to be equal to negative 585, negative 101. And here now we have some shear in the 1, 2 coordinate system, 88 MPA for tau 1, 2. All right, so these are our uh, shear stresses, sort of our, our stresses that occur in the principal material coordinates. So we'll come back to these, and we need to compare these guys to the values that would cause failure using various failure criteria. To check whether or not we would predict failure or not. So we'll move on to the next portion of the problem now where we're looking at would these stresses cause failure given the variety of failure theories that we have in the class. All right. So sort of back to the problem statement here quickly. We want to check first this max stress criteria. Okay. Remember what that looks like. The max stress criteria basically says that if any of the stresses in the principal directions exceed the stress that would predict failure, then we fail. So here, remember our max stress criteria is something like if sigma 1 is greater than or equal to F1t, or if sigma 1 is less than or equal to negative F1c, this is sort of for the stress in the one direction, we fail. If sigma 2 is greater than or equal to F2t, or sigma 2 is less than or equal to negative F, sorry, negative F2c, we fail. And if sigma 6 is greater than or equal to F6, we fail. All right. So in this particular problem, our stress in the 1, our stress in the 2, and our stress in the 6, we're going to want to take a look at those values to determine if we're going to compare against the tensile or compressive failure stresses. And here we see that our F, or our, our sigma 1 is negative. We see that our sigma 2 is negative, And we see that our F6 is positive. All right. So what that means is when we're looking at the max stress criteria, we want to take a look at this criteria, which is sort of for compressive failure in the one direction. This criteria, which is sort of for compressive failure in the two direction, and obviously we we're going to take a look at this guy. So let's get into that. We're given in the problem the various stresses that would cause failure, so these strengths for this particular material. You can pull that up um, if you want to take a look at that again. But we need, and we're going to just remind ourselves here, that F1C is 620 MPa. F Two C, and this problem is given as 128 MPa. And finally, F6, which we're going to need, also given in this problem, is 89 MPa. So I want to compare each of these to the stresses that are applied and see if any of them would cause failure. All right. So my first question is: Is the stress in the one direction less than or equal to negative F1C? This is a question. All right, well, the stress in the one direction, we calculated this already, is negative 585 MPa. And we want to know, is this less than or equal to that which would cause failure, which is negative 620 MPa? So since I passed kindergarten, I don't know, when do you learn inequalities? I think like maybe like second grade, OK? Obviously, this is not true, so this is false. Okay, and so we're safe. In the one direction, we are safe according to this theory. We still have to check the other directions. So here in the two direction, are we less than that which would cause failure and compression? All right, well again, we calculated sigma two is negative 85 MPa, and we want to know, is this less than or equal to that which would cause failure, which we know in the two direction here is negative 128 MPa? And again, I pass kindergarten and know that this is not true. This is false. So we are safe again in the two direction. 
the last I need to, to look at is the shear stress. So is my shear stress sigma six greater than or equal to that which would cause failure? Here my shear stress uh, in six is 88 MPA. And I want to know, is this greater than or equal to that which would cause failure? Which I was given as 89 MPA. Again, this is false. And so I'm safe. This one, pretty close. I'm uncomfortable here. I'm really getting close to that failure strength um, in the one, two direction. So I would predict safety by max stress theory, but I don't feel good about it. All right. All right, but I don't love it. Let me tell you, I do not love that situation that's currently happening. All right. Next, we're going to look at uh, the Psi Hill failure criteria. I'm going to kind of gloss over the max strain theory. I'll tell you, I'm not going to ask anything about max strain theory. Max strain theory is just like very rarely used in practice. I th max stress theory is like rarely used in practice, but I think it's a good place to sort of like start as a demonstration. Um, I'll just say here, not doing max strain theory. All right, I'm not going to ask you about this on the test, on any test. Rarely used, so we're not doing it. Instead, I'll just jump then right to Sci Hill. All right, and remember what that one looked like. This is very akin to the von Mises theory in your ME3005 class. And so remember what this looks like. We said that we kind of now have some normalization of each one of the stress components adding to become, you know, a percentage of the whole. So here, what I'm checking is my stress in the one direction normalized by the stress which would cause failure in the one direction squared plus the stress in the two direction normalized by the stress that would cause failure in the two direction squared plus the shear stress sigma six normalized by the shear stress that would cause failure squared minus this interaction term which is stress in one stress in two over f1 squared i want to know if this is greater than or equal to one if this is true we fail all right. Now, reminder, the values that we take for F1 and F2 depend on whether sigma 1 or sigma 2 are positive or negative. In both of these situations, sigma 1 and sigma 2 are negative. We have compressive stresses in the 1 and the 2 directions. So we want to take the failure stresses and the denominators of those bits there as the compressive failure stress values. OK, so since sigma one and sigma two less than zero. We will use F1C and F2C. All right, so I have all these values. I'm just gonna go ahead and calculate. All right, stress in the one direction. I know this is negative 585. I'm working in MPA here, so I'm gonna drop the MPA for sort of space reasons, but understand here I'm working in MPA. So it's negative 585 over F1. We know the failure strength in the one direction in tension. 620, sorry, in compression, that was given, squared, plus sigma 2. This is the actual stress in the two direction, negative 101, divided by the failure stress in the two direction, which is 128 MPA. All this squared, plus the shear stress 6, which is 88 MPA, divided by that which would cause failure. 89 MPA squared minus the interaction term here, which is negative 585 times negative 101, all divided by that which would cause failure in the one direction squared, which is 620 squared. I want to know, is this greater than one? I can look at each one of these contributions individually to sort of like gauge how much of the whole 
I am using up by the stresses in the various directions. Hopefully that sort of makes sense to people. If I go through this, I'll get something like 0.89 for this first term, plus the second term here is 0.62, plus this third term here, I'm basically almost using everything up with this third term alone, 0.98. And here I'll have minus a double negative, so I will subtract a 0.15 for this like interaction term. Now if we add this up on the left hand side, you're going to see something like 2.34. Is this greater than or equal to 1? Frankly, yes. So we would predict failure with this particular model. And I just want to point out how this is really working. So we see here for like the shear term, which we saw almost caused us to get into failure in the max stress criteria, we're using up like 98% of the total amount of strength that we have available for our composite, okay, with this method. In the two direction, we're using up like 62% of the strength that we have. In the one direction, we're using up like 89% of the strength that we have. So if we use 89% in the one direction, 62% in the two direction, 98% in the three direction, it ain't looking so good for us, okay? So that's what we're seeing with this particular theory. And we know that this theory is generally a little bit more conservative, so here we see that conservation sort of rearing its head and predicting failure for us. All right, last one is kind of the big one. It's the big boy. It's a lot of calculation here, and this is the Psi Wu failure criteria. I'm going to write the general equation here and sort of remind you what that looks like. But this is going to be F1 sigma 1 plus F2 sigma 2 plus F11 sigma 1 squared plus F22 sigma 2 squared plus F66 sigma 6 squared. plus two times this interaction term, F12, sigma one, sigma two. I wanna know, is this greater than or equal to one? If it is, we fail. This is again, kind of another energy theory that gives us like a percentage of a whole, except now we have sort of like multiple um, terms inside of this equation. We have like an elliptical equation here that kind of defines our, our energy condition. It's actually an ellipsoid. It's kind of a three-dimensional equation, but okay, get the general idea. So we need all of these like leading coefficients here. And I'll tell you for the Psi Wu theory, it's much easier to work in GPA than it is to M work in MPA. And you'll see why in just a second. So here I'll say, I'll work in GPA going forward. So that's just a, a reminder of, of me doing that and what I'm doing. And the reason for that is because we have a lot of inverted strength values and I would rather invert like 0.6 rather than inverting 600. Okay, so let's move into calculating some of these things. Remember from the notes that we had this um, leading coefficient F1 is gonna be a combination of the strengths and compression and tension in the following way. One on F1T minus one on F1C. I have these values given in the problem, so let's just go ahead and put them in. And again, I'm working in GPA, so it was given as 1140 MPA for F1T minus one on F1C, which was 620 MPA, so 0 0.62 GPA. So my script F1 is gonna be sort of the addition of these two. And the reason I work in GPA, you can sort of see it now. I'd rather divide by 1.14, divide by 1140. Just my algebra works out to be a little cleaner. Here, negative 0.736, one on GPA. Right. Notice I've taken the positive value of F1C in this calculation. All right, continuing. This F2, 
1 on F2T minus 1 on F2C. Again, these given in the problem, I'm going to convert to GPA on the fly. Remember, our failure in the two direction and tension is the weakest. Here is given as 39 MPA. So that's 0 0.039 GPA. Sounds like some of you guys. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. All right, one on F2C. F2C was given as 128 MPA. So this is 0.128 GPA. Work this guy out and you'll get 17.81 on GPA. All right, continuing. F66, here this is just one on F6 squared. So this is one on 89 MPA, or what I'll write as 0 0.089 GPA squared, giving me that F66 here is equal to 126 one on GPA squared. F11, this is 1 on F1T times F1C. Again, I'm given these values, so we just kind of plug and chug here. This is 1 on 1.14 GPA times F1C, which is 620 MPA or 0.62 GPA. And that gives me this F11. Here now I need a 1 on GPA square termed. This is going to be 1.41. 1 on GPA square minus 1 on GPA squared. All right, I'm just building these coefficients, building these coefficients, building the house. Script F22, 1 on F2T times F2C. 1 on, again, F2T is the weakest. It's 39 MPA, so 0 0.039 GPA times F2C, 128 MPA, or 0.128 uh, GPA. This is going to lead me to script F22 is going to be 200 1 on GPA squared. All right. Last coefficient is this interaction coefficient, F12. Remember in the notes, this is negative one half square root of F11 times F22. Okay, so we can just calculate this straight away. Negative one half F11 is 1.41, 1, .41, 1 on GPA squared times F22, which is 200, 1 on GPA squared. After I calculate this, I'll get that this like interaction coefficient, script F12, is going to be equal here, uh, let me get my notes, to negative 8.4, 1 on GPA squared. OK, got all my coefficients. Now it's time to roll with my equation. So all together. Time for the full Sai Wu equation. Always a bit of a headache, but um, got to roll with it. And remember, all my coefficients are in terms of one on GPA or one on GPA squared. So I'm going to insert my stresses for my equation here in GPA instead of an MPA, which I've kind of done up to now. So first term we have is script F1 times sigma 1. So here this is negative 0.736, 1 on GPA, times the stress in the 1 direction in GPA, which is negative 0.585 GPA. My next term is script F2 times sigma 2. Script F2 here is 17.8, 1 on GPA. multiplied by the stress in the two direction here again in GPA, negative 0 0.101. My next term is going to be my uh, 
script f11 times sigma 1 squared. So here my script f11 is 1.41. one on GPA squared times my stress in the one direction, which is negative 0.585 GPA squared. Adding to this, the script F22 times sigma 2. Script F22 is uh, 200, one on GPA squared times sigma 2, which is negative 0.101. GPA squared plus continuing on. This is my F66 script F66 term. So this is 126. One on GPA squared multiplied by my stress in the 6.088 GPA squared. And finally, my interaction term two times script F12, which is negative 8.4, one on GPA squared, multiplied by my stress in one and my stress in two, negative 0.585 GPA for sigma one, multiplied by negative 0.101 GPA for sigma two. And I wanna know, is all this stuff greater than or equal to one? Yikes, got a lot of terms here. So I calculate all the terms and I get the following. 0.431 minus 1.8 plus 0.483. This is just coming from all the terms. Plus 2.04 plus 0.976 minus 0.993, my interaction term. Is this all greater than or equal to 1? Okay. Add all of these things up and I'll get 1.14. Is this greater than or equal to 1? Answer here, yes. So we predict failure. So the Psi Wu theory predicts failure. Interestingly, the two energy um, methods here, the Psi Wu and the Psi Hill, both predict failure, but the max stress criteria, which sort of just looks at the stresses in the one or the two or the six direction by themselves without sort of considering the other stresses that are being applied. That max stress theory did not predict failure. So again, max stress theory is like the least conservative, pretty scary um, situation. And then some of these energy theories are much more conservative. So um, that's going to be it for this example problem. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in class on Monday. Unless you're watching this some other day, in which case I hope I'll see you soon.